Hi, I'm Michael Andrake from Ground Zero, Minnesota. Welcome to Rethinking the World. Our topic today is spies and crime, and our guest is Mr. Gene Wheaton, retired criminal investigations officer for the Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps. Correct. Over a long career, you served in Korea and in Vietnam, and I'd like you to, in Iran, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on that for our audience that doesn't know you personally. Well, I first served uh, when I was very young in Korea in the Marine Corps. Uh, came home, was a police officer in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a couple of years. And I was an OSI agent, Office of Special Investigations, a criminal investigator and counterintelligence agent for the Air Force for eight, nine years. Uh, served in Italy and in the States on that. And then made an inter-service transfer to the Army, and I was a special agent with the Army CID, the Criminal Investigation mm -hmm. Division, until I retired from the Army. I appreciate that very much, and I want to emphasize for our audience, uh, we have interviewed a lot of spies and a lot of detectives, actually, and Gene is almost unique to us in our experience in both the depth of his criminal investigations background and the combination of doing that and also working with the covert operations uh, scene, which I think gives you a special perspective on both sides of, of these issues. Uh, so, Gene, we want to go over some of the cases that you've had personal contact with as we wrestle with the problem of criminal activity within the intelligence community or peripheral to the intelligence community. And you feel free to analyze that for us, if you can, help us understand how it goes on and why it's so hard to stop. You worked on the Jim Sabo case, for example, a Marine Corps colonel who uh, died here in California not too long ago. Tell us a little about that. Yes, I did. Uh Colonel Jimmy Sabo was the number three man at the Marine Corps Air Station at El Toro in Orange County. Uh, in January of 1991, the first week of the Gulf War, he was found shot to death in his backyard. And uh, the Naval Investigative Service and the Marine Corps wrote it off as a suicide. Uh, the family contacted me and asked me to assist in that investigation. Uh, I've worked on that for about four years, three and a half mm -hmm. years. Uh, we established scientifically and forensically that uh, Colonel Sable was murdered and it was staged to look like a suicide. And I was called back to Washington, D.C. by the Commandant of the Marine Corps to brief his staff uh, in 1993 on the case, uh, which I did. Um, we uh, put together a solid case with some of the world's top experts that he was murdered, uh, including the top uh, respiratory physiologist in the world, who's the head of the department at UCLA Medical School. Uh, we presented this to a federal court in Santa Ana, California, and the covert operators with their connections in the Justice Department sent a man out to California to monitor the case and to shut down the, prosecu the civil suit that we filed in order to try to force a criminal case in the federal courts. Right. And why, uh, simply, why were, were they trying to shut that down? The covert operators were using contracts with the Marine Corps to haul weaponry and money around the world uh, through a series of front companies flying uh, military C-130 aircraft that had been stolen out of military channels and they were flying weaponry to the Gulf War and Colonel Sabo was going to expose this. Mm -hmm. No drugs involved as far as you know in that? Their drugs were involved with the aircraft, not mm -hmm. necessarily with the Marine Corps Air Station at El Toro. but. Uh, this whole network flies illegal stolen weapons for, out of U.S. military stockpiles uh, to revolutionary groups and, uh, and uh, civil wars all over the world, and they sell them to our friends as well as our enemies. And they have a covert operation going on as we speak, and a secret war going on down in Peru, which overlaps between revolution, narcotics, mm -hmm. and the smuggling of narcotics into the states and and uh, the laundering of huge amounts billions of dollars of drug money and right this. and and colonel sabo was on the periphery of that he was the chief of operations on the base so he he knew about the covert aircraft 
uh, that he was told to keep his nose out of their business, mm -hmm. and uh, and he was pretty straight arrow, and he said he wasn't going to have anything to do with it. Right. Had a clash, and the next day he was dead. In his backyard on base. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, a great case to start with because we have uh, discussed many cases over the course of this series, and the uh, the dilemma is why is the government uh, backing up this kind of thing and what do we do when good officers that are serving the country and other people, a lot of innocent people get hurt here. So uh, if you can help us understand, somebody rationalizes this and says that this is okay, uh, did the base commander say make it look like a suicide or we just won't have a regular criminal investigation or how did that well, work? Well, the, the, the general in charge of the base uh, Tom Adams was forced into retirement in disgrace over this case. Mm -hmm. So was his number two man, a colonel by the name of Joe Underwood, who happened to also be the next door neighbor of Colonel Sabo. Mm -hmm. uh, they sent a team, the Inspector General of the Marine Corps, out here to California to try to shut down the case. And uh, they sent a the uh, executive assistant to the Attorney General of the United States out in charge of shutting it down. and. He passed himself off as a Marine Corps colonel out of headquarters Marine Corps when, in mm -hmm. fact, he was a member of the U.S. Justice Department. Right. Well, this is the dilemma that we're all struggling with, is how do you solve problems like this if the federal government, for whatever reason, comes in and deliberately tries to uh, subvert the truth? Now, I want to touch on a number of other cases, so we may get back sure. to this, but I want to make sure that we uh, cover others. Now, uh, Vince Foster's death is mysterious also, and you were consulted uh, to comment on that. Can you lay us out just the essence of why that uh, looks like a murder rather than a suicide? Well, I was called back to Washington by uh, some national TV investigative uh, journalism uh, producers uh, to look into the case when it started becoming bizarre. And uh, I walked the crime scene, I talked to witnesses, I, I reviewed the entire case file, and I am a homicide investigator and have been for 40 years. And uh, in a nutshell, the only thing I can tell you is there was no evidence of suicide. The, the, all of the evidence points toward murder, but if you don't conduct a proper homicide investigation, uh, that evidence is lost. Uh, they got the Park Service to go in and investigate that, and the Park Service is really just crowd control and traffic police. No, they know nothing about homicide investigations. Mm -hmm. They claim that they run about 35 death investigations a year, but it's really derelicts and, and right. drug dealers that but they find dead But there are some real anomalies in that yeah. case. Can you focus on those quickly? Well, the, uh, the first thing is the alleged suicide note that uh, he supposedly wrote. Uh, Vince Foster never wrote a suicide note. His office in the White House was searched. His briefcase was searched in the White House. Mm -hmm. Nothing was found in it, and several days later, a torn up piece of paper in 27 pieces was found in his briefcase mm -hmm. that they alleged was a suicide note. Uh, there was no effort made to collect fingerprints off of that mm -hmm. 27 uh, pieces of paper. and. Paper is the easiest thing in the world to get fingerprints off of. So whoever tore it up, if there was no fingerprints on it, had to have been wearing gloves. Right. Plus there was a gun in his hand and other anomalies about the crime scene. Well, the, the whole crime scene was, uh, was a farce. The, uh, the, the weapon was a typical assassination or, or hit weapon used mm -hmm. by organized crime. It was made up of parts of two different weapons that were 50 years old that could never be traced. Uh, his fingerprints weren't found on the weapon. Uh, the, he was laying uh, out just like you would see somebody in a morgue with his hands at his sides and the weapon grasped in his hand with his thumb through the trigger guard. Uh, the, the crime scene, nothing about it Made any and sense. you've had a lot of experience with homicide investigations. I've investigated violent deaths, probably a thousand, fifteen hundred mm -hmm. of them. Right. Well, those are the details, and there are many more for those who want to dig into it. But now I want to ask you, what does it mean? 
Why, why would somebody kill uh, Vincent Foster, an attorney in the White House? Well, that wasn't what I was looking into. My question was why didn't they run a proper investigation? Why cover it up? Okay. Uh, and why the Park Police were al allowed to run a homicide investigation on a government reservation, which Fort Marcy Park mm -hmm. was, uh, instead of bringing the FBI in, particularly when the man was the president's legal counsel right. and his closest friend since they were children. Well, please, uh, shed some light on that. Well, it, it doesn't make any sense. Obviously, there's something major that they wanted to cover up by not properly investigating his death. Mm -hmm. uh, you can speculate. I, as an investigator, I tend to not speculate too much, but all of the major covert operations going on in, in Arkansas, down in Mena, Arkansas, the, uh, they were laundering money through ADFA, the uh, Arkansas Development Agency that is part of the Whitewater scandal. Vince Foster was part of that. Uh, the MENA operation itself was so bizarre, and it's still going on. It was created in the early 80s under the covert operators under George Bush when he was vice president, and, and uh, Bill Clinton was the governor of Arkansas. And uh, part of the deal was that if Bill Clinton would go along with covering this thing up, uh, they would use the influence they had to assure that he would be the Democratic nominee for president. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very, very convoluted thing that crosses over party lines. There are, there are airplanes at MENA, Arkansas today, and I was only there about 18 months ago checking on it again. Uh, with the local police and the state police, uh, flying weapons all over the world, uh, part of these stolen C-130s that Jimmy Sabo was going to expose, mm -hmm. flew out of Mena, Arkansas. Uh, you've, got, you've got covert operators that have their finger in the Democratic Party and the Republican Party who blackmail or influence people on both sides. So the Republicans are afraid to expose what was going on in Arkansas extensively because they created it. Or the covert operators created it under their watch. I want to emphasize that dynamic just for our audience because, and you can elaborate on it, uh, most Americans first haven't even heard of MENA, so they've got to have connections in the media also. We've heard lots and lots about Whitewater, but very little about MENA, but as far as I can tell, there's excellent evidence that there was gun, gun running, there was money drops to the Arkansas political establishment back in the early mid-80s, isn't it? Absolutely. I started right. investigating MENA, Arkansas in 1987. So it's been there for almost 10 years, Yes. but it has barely been touched at all by the major media while they've spent enormous amounts of time on, on some less important things. Uh, so they, they get a finger in both political parties and they've obviously got some influence over the media and the Justice Department if they're sending Justice Department people out to suppress criminal investigations, that was the implication of something else that you well, said there are, in there are, case. There are, there are attorneys within the intelligence community, mm -hmm. in the Pentagon and the CIA, who have been what they refer to as sheep dipped. They have them resign from their service, but maintain a reserve affiliation either with the Pentagon or a backdoor connection to the agency as an attorney and then they through political connections move them into the Justice Department. Would the former Attorney General, I think William Barr was his name? He was a CIA officer. Right. Yes. Would, would he be that kind of an example of that kind of a person? He, he, would, he would be one that is more obvious. You can, you know, the, the Assistant Attorney General of the United States who came out to California to shut down the mm -hmm. Sable investigation was a reserve Marine Corps Colonel that they recruited years ago and had him get out and get into the Justice Department so they could network mm -hmm. covert operations inside the Justice so it'd be System a lot harder of the United States. To, to know that he had a CIA connection. There are damage control people that right. can shut down investigations that get too close to the covert operators. Right. And all this is to do what? To protect uh, arms shipments or to make money or? Well, it's a little more complex than that. The, this goes back into the mid-70s when they had the, the major scandals involving CIA officer Ed Wilson 
uh, when George Bush was CIA director and Vernon, General Vernon Walters was his deputy and Ted Shackley was the DDO, the Deputy Director mm -hmm. of Operations. They had a major scandal of Ed Wilson uh, training Colonel Gaddafi's terrorists in Libya with U.S. Special Forces, NCOs. Right. And he shipped 40,000 pounds of C-4 explosives over there on a DC-8 out of Houston, Texas. And when it started becoming public knowledge, and it only started after September of 76, after the, the uh, assassination of Orlando Letelier, the, the Chilean diplomat in exile in Washington, D.C., after that it started becoming public knowledge, and Bob Woodward started writing some articles in the Washington Post. And so they decided to cut their ties with Ed Wilson and make him go down the tubes as a, as a lone ranger, having moved all of this military equipment and people uh, massive amounts uh, on covert airplanes to Libya. And uh, as a result of that, the scandal grew so big that uh, in 1977, there was a, an event called the Halloween Massacre in between October and December 77, where CIA Director Stansfield Turner saw that the covert operators were totally out of control and fired, about 800 fired, of them. fired over 800 of them, mm -hmm. forced them either to resign, retire, or be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ted Shackley and Tom Kleins and, and General Secord and, and uh, former Assistant Secretary of Defense. All Frank, these folks whose names we've heard from yeah, Iran. They were all part, caught up in the scandal and had to quit. And they felt that they were the true secret police patriots of the world and that uh, Ted Shackley had planned on becoming the next Director of Central Intelligence after Bush if Jerry Ford won the election. And, uh, and they felt that they had been betrayed by their country, so they decided that the country and the Constitution and the Congress was their enemy. Okay. Yeah. Now, we're, we're going to get back to the macro scale. I want to point out that uh, some of these folks go back a long way, like uh, Ted Shackley, you mentioned. He was uh, involved in Southeast Asia during Vietnam, right? Yes. And some of them go back as far as the OSS, I guess, uh, Richard Helms and Bill Colby. Right, and Bill and, Casey. And right. Uh, well, uh, you also investigated the Gander air crash, which some people may not have heard of, but 248 American servicemen died in a crash in Canada. Uh, could you, in just a minute or two, give us the sense of uh, how this relates to Iran-Contra, which we have heard of? The covert operators that I was running with, I was recruited into Ali North's network in mm -hmm. 1985, and the covert operators I was running with had several contract airlines that they established spin-offs of Air America, the CIA airline that came out of Southeast Asia. One of the airlines was Aero Air, a contract airline at Miami Airport, uh, owned by a guy named George Batchelor, an old aviation spook. Secord, Ali North, Bill Casey, that whole crowd, Shackley, used Aero Air as a contract airline to haul weapons all over the world and to use, to, as, to justify it without anybody looking at it, it was, uh, they used the cover of hauling troops from the Sinai to the United mm -hmm. States as part of the Camp David peacekeeping accord. But that, that's very illegal to haul explosives and troops at the same time in the same aircraft. It's, it? a, it's a major felony. It's a violation of military law, federal law, FAA rules, the ICAO, the International mm -hmm. Civil Aviation Organization. It violates all those rules to haul hot cargo on a passenger airplane. Mm -hmm. And they got 248 soldiers and eight crew members killed as a result of that. Gene, we were getting into the Enterprise. What is that and is it gone? And how did you get involved in it? The Enterprise if, is it different than what they referred to in the Iran-Contra mm -hmm. affair, and it is still as strong as ever. I, in the late 1970s, I was director of security on a program in Iraq, a CIA program called the IBEX program, and the front company running it was Rockwell Corporation. I got drawn in as director of security after the assassinations of the three managers of the program in 1976. That's where I met Dick Secord. General Secord was the chief of the Air Force section. Albert Hakim was the bag man on the IBEX program. Uh, Ed Wilson had an office in Tehran at that time. After I evacuated my family out of Iran during the revolution, I couldn't go back there because I'd been a police and counterterrorism advisor to the Shah's government. I started 
uh, I got some contracts with the Saudi royal family to do counterterrorism and uh, and train a security force for the royal family, and brought my son to to Riyadh to mm -hmm. help work on that program. And then I started stumbling across uh, uh, Dick Secord again over there. They had taken the IBEX program after the revolution in Iran and simply renamed it uh, the Saudi AWACS program and moved it across the Gulf. And this was a big money machine so they could get kickbacks off of these programs uh, for covert operations. In the mid-1980s, 1985, now I was running with all of the old covert operators uh, that I met while I was on the IBEX program. I was recruited into Ali North Secord's enterprise, if you want to call it mm -hmm. that, uh, in 1985. They wanted me because of, I'm a Farsi linguist and because of my counterterrorism work in the Middle East, they wanted me to set up a death squad to go after what they would identify as terrorists in the Middle East. They wanted me to set up a, a program to move weaponry to Afghanistan through Pakistan. At that time, I was vice president of an airline. I had a, some mm -hmm. car, 23 cargo airplanes, and they wanted those. And planes. they were looking for cargo yes. capacity big time. Yes, they wanted them for the, the Afghan program and for the Contras. Right. And, uh, and I was taken by CIA people to the State Department, to up on the hill, to the offices of Congressman Bill McCollum of Florida, and introduced to Rob and Ali North's outside man of the Contras, mm -hmm. and to Vaughn Forrest. And uh, I, I became a trusted insider with these people, but I, I, it, over a period of time, you don't learn this stuff in one day, but over a period of years, I, I, it evolved that these guys had taken over the government. Uh, uh, in, after Shackley and Kleins and Carlucci and Secord and all those guys were fired from the government, they decided that uh, since the government was their enemy, they better infiltrate it and take it over. So what they did was simply stated that we're trained to install uh, generals and dictators and, and people under the control of the covert operators in governments in Central and South America and Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and the Philippines. They said, why don't we use our expertise around the world to focus in on the United States and treat the United States like the world's biggest banana republic and take it over? And they used those exact words, treat the United States like the world's biggest banana republic and take it over. And the first thing they had to do was get covert operator George Bush, former CIA director, in the White House. So between 1979 and 81, they started funneling shoeboxes full of money into con congressmen's campaign coffers. Mm -hmm. uh, if they wouldn't accept the money, they got them compromised with women on sex. Sex, bribery, and threats of assassination are the key tools of trade the craft. covert operators. They, they right. call it their trade craft. Don't lose your train of thought. I want to interrupt briefly because, you know, I can imagine people in our audience don't know going, this is, this is too much. They took over our government. And yet I want to reaffirm what you're saying. You're telling us things that you saw. And I want to ask just one detailed question and then you get back on uh, describing the course of events. We talked to Jim Rothstein, whom you know, a retired New York City detective, about yes, compromise operations in particular. And he was talking about the use of children, not just adult women, uh, to compromise politicians, but the use and abuse of children. Did you ever encounter any of that in your uh, experience? I, I did on the, on the edges of it. I, I would love to name the man, but there is a very prominent man in Washington, D.C., very prominent, who was on the board of directors of some of Ed Wilson's front mm -hmm. companies, was a personal friend of his and George Bush's, who used to furnish page boys mm -hmm. to dirty old senators to do sexual favors. Well, let's not go down that road because we have covered it and it's quite a distraction from the main point, which is the arrogation of secret power to the point where they can actually talk about taking over the government and continue running drugs and guns around the world, even though we've all had the Iran Contra hearings. Did that stop all this or, that, or not? That never even put a dent in it. In fact, it let it run freer after that because everybody stopped looking. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in a way, the Iran Contra hearings, which were a major cover up, uh, were a favor to these guys because the American public and the media was, and the Congress were burnt out on the hearings in the Iran Contra, and they assumed they went away after that. Mm -hmm. They didn't even slow down. They're going heavier now Today. than they were then, yes. And they're moving. 
They're selling weapons to our enemies as well as our friends and moving huge amounts, billions of dollars worth of money around the world. They have attorneys with front companies who are investing this money in high-tech industry in the United States. They're buying into the media, to the umbrella corporations that own the national media, into the aerospace and defense industry and the telecommunications industry uh, through front men, not so they have majority ownership, but so that they have enough ownership of stock in these corporations that they are a single block of, of stock owners mm -hmm. who can place people on the board of directors of these corporations. Uh, these guys have bribed and blackmailed so many congressmen that all of these congressmen that you see and senators who are no longer running for election, most of them are burnt out because they have been blackmailed and threatened for so many years that they either have to continue to compromise their integrity for the rest of their lives or leave U.S. government service. Mm -hmm. And that's a very serious proposition because theoretically the Congress is overseeing all this. Uh, um, let me add just this point. We, we had some very intimate conversations with Senator Dave Durenberger in Minnesota when he was the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Oversight Committee. And I think we're going to do a second uh, program with you to talk about the deep structure of how the politi political process gets paralyzed. We only got about 30 seconds left for today. You say that sat in on a meeting involving these folks that had to do with militia topics. And I, could you just characterize that briefly, and we'll go on with that. Uh. Yes, in the mid-'80s, I was listening to the covert operators in Washington, D.C., talk about how jealous they were of the KGB having domestic police and secret police powers mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union, and they wanted those powers in America. And they decided one way to get that was to create or infiltrate patriotic militia movements in America and cause disruption and and controversy and clash between ethnic groups and racial groups in the United States so that we would give up some of our constitutional right. rights and they could take over. Well, thank you for today, Gene. And uh, we're just going to do a second uh, tape with you because these topics are too important and too complicated to be dealt with in just 28 minutes. So thank you all for tuning in to Rethinking the World, and we'll see you again soon, I hope. Ground Zero Minnesota is an all-volunteer education nonprofit dedicated to informed democracy and human survival. We organized in 1982 to deal with nuclear weapons issues, but have always supported education about human rights, the environment, corruption in governments, and other topics pertaining to war, peace, and human survival. We cannot guarantee the accuracy of opinions expressed by anyone on this series, but we screen them as carefully as we can and have concluded that their stories deserve a public hearing. For more information about our videos or other efforts to address the developing global crisis,